Good afternoon and welcome to IBA News this Sunday the 24th of July. I'm Elon Aslan-Levy joining you live from Jerusalem. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today continued to defend his decision to delay the opening of a new Israel broadcasting corporation in the face of criticism from ministers that he is wasting public money and hurting freedom of expression in Israel. IBA's political reporter Kalev Ben David joins me now in the studio with all the details. Kalev. Thanks, Alon. The dispute in the coalition over reforming public broadcasting came to the cabinet today with Prime Minister Netanyahu answering critics over his decision to postpone the start of a new broadcasting cooperation until the beginning of 2018 from its original start date of October 1st this year. If I wanted to darken the screens of public broadcasting, I would allow the new corporation to go on air before it is ready, ensuring its failure, Netanyahu said. The Prime Minister explained the ultimate goal of the broadcasting reforms and the reason he has held on to the communications portfolio is to promote greater competition in local television, allowing more channels and more news coverage. Any investor from the political left or the right will be able to invest in these channels, Netanyahu said, giving more freedom of choice for viewers. The Prime Minister's comments answered remarks made last week by Education Minister Naftali Bennett that suggested Netanyahu's real goal was to weaken public broadcasting as part of a strategy to blunt media criticism of him. The Prime Minister had no answer, though, to Finance Minister Moshe Kahlon's criticism that the delay in replacing the IBA with a new corporation would cost about a half billion shekels in public money and he would not approve the funds. Officials from the Prime Minister's office and Finance Ministry are negotiating the budget for the delay, with some reports suggesting a compromise that would see the new broadcasting corpor corporation launch earlier than 2018. The Knesset Economic Affairs Committee is meeting now to discuss the issue. Hello. Kalev, we'd so hoped that this issue of the corporation had been put to rest with an extension till 2018. Why is the issue of public broadcasting a political football in this country? Alone, ever since the Free Daily Yisrael Hayom was started by Netanyahu supporter Sheldon Adelson, the American Jewish billionaire, there has been suspicion among politicians here in Israel, including some sitting in the government with Netanyahu, that the prime minister's real strategy is to dominate the Israeli media scene in order to blunt criticism of him. And this colors what's going on with public broadcasting. There's a feeling among even some of his coalition partners, he wants to weaken Israel's Channel One, whose news department is sometimes been critical of him. The problem is, of course, there is a real need for reforms in public broadcasting, which includes this English news broadcast. Everybody agrees with it. And the issue has become politicized and it's going to continue on that way. How should we understand the prime minister's desire then to liberalize the telecommunications market in Israel? The in prime minister, the journalism sure, broadcast. well, listen, the prime minister has been consistent in all along, and he made that point today in the cabinet, he wants to, he, that he sees liberalizing the television market similar to liberalizing the telecommunications field, liberalizing other uh, different areas of business in Israel, allowing more competition. So that is, comp that is consistent with the prime minister. But again, critics suggest that when he says investors will come in, that he's perhaps out there lining up investors to create TV channels that will be more supportive of, it, of his policies. So is, it is consistent for the Prime Minister, but still a lot of suspicion of his motives here. Oh, well, we'll be keeping a close eye to see what comes out of the Knesset with regards to IBA. Thank you, Kalev. Thanks. Sergeant Elor Azaria, the soldier accused of manslaughter for shooting a neutralized terrorist in Hebron in March, took to the witness stand today at the Jaffa Military Court. Azaria's defense has notified the court that he has recalled more details about the incident, which the prosecution calls the fourth development in his version of events and promises to pursue in cross-examination. Azaria's defense centers on the claim that he believed his life was in danger when he fired the fateful bullet. Azaria spoke of the pressure and atmosphere of fear affecting soldiers on patrol in Hebron and stated that he treated Palestinians there the way you treat people. Azaria called for a military police investigation against his company commander, whom he accuses of slapping him in the face after the, after the incident. The defendant's testimony is scheduled to last three days, with two days of cross-examination starting tomorrow. The prosecution has already finished calling up its witnesses, who mostly contradicted Azaria's defense, with the battalion commander claiming Azaria had fired in revenge. Sticking with the army and Brigadier General Ofek Bukhris, the suspended head of the IDF's Command and Staff College, will stand trial on 16 counts including rape and sexual assault against two female subordinates. 
Bukharis denies accusations, calling them baseless and vowing to win the fight for his life in court. On Friday, a former commander of his, retired General Gershon Hakoin, defended the officer as a hero and icon on army radio, comparing his alleged deeds to King David's seduction of Bathsheba. He later apologized. Meanwhile, lawyers of one of the soldiers, allegedly raped by Bukharis, were set to file a police complaint this morning after her identity was leaked on social media by supporters of the general. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu expressed his condolences to Germany following Friday's shooting spree at the Munich shopping mall, which left nine people dead and more than a dozen wounded. The Prime Minister wished the injured a speedy recovery and emphasized that Israel stands behind Germany at such a difficult hour. Tehran also Members of the public, government officials as well as tourists lit candles and left flowers at the Olympia shopping center and nearby McDonald's eatery. The site where 18-year-old Ali Sonbali went on a shooting rampage, killing nine people and injuring 27. Sonbali, a German citizen of Iranian descent born and bred in Munich, was described by officials as mentally unstable, a teenager who suffered from depression and had received psychiatric treatment. Police quickly ruled out any links to terror or the Islamic State. Investigators believe Sambali, who was bullied at school and described as a loner, may have been inspired by the shooting rampage in Norway that occurred exactly five years earlier, when Anders Brevik fatally shot 77 people. A search in his apartment revealed documents relating to the Brevik attack and other mass shootings. Friday's attack was the second in Germany in less than a week and the third on civilians in a European city in eight days. Early Friday evening, downtown Munich was crowded with shoppers, visiting the Olympia Mall, with dozens sitting in the nearby McDonald branch eating, when Symboli brandishing a gun began his shooting rampage. According to police, Symboli had earlier hacked a woman's Facebook account, posting a fake offer of free food at the McDonald's in order to lure more customers there. From the McDonald's eatery, Somboli proceeded to the shopping mall. Security forces thronged to the site where they ordered shoppers to stay undercover, placing Munich, one of Europe's largest cities, on lockdown. All public transport was halted, including the trains. Terrified shoppers sought safety in strangers' homes, shops and nearby hotels, as police called on the public to remain behind closed doors. Security forces, including special anti-terror units, searched the area, fearing initially that three gunmen were on the loose. More than 3,000 security personnel were involved in the mass operation. At several sites, police engaged in a shootout with Symboli, whose body was found hours later in a nearby side street where he died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Police said Symboli was carrying some 300 bullets in his backpack. Flags flew at half-mast yesterday as the country mourned the nine people killed. The majority of the victims were teenagers, and of the 27 injured, five remain in serious condition. The country's leadership convened the emergency cabinet to review security procedures and discuss necessary action to try and prevent further attacks taking place. Mogadukevich, IBA News. Over to regional affairs, Arab foreign ministers have vowed to defeat terrorism, naming this a top priority ahead of the upcoming Arab League summit set to kick off tomorrow in Mauritania. In a statement released ahead of the meeting, foreign ministers also called to find a definitive solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, welcoming the French and Egyptian initiatives to renew negotiations between the two sides. Ministers also called to end the crises within the Arab world, namely in Syria, Libya and Yemen. In related news, retired Saudi general Dr. Anwar Eshki, who arrived in the country last week in an effort to promote the Arab Peace Initiative, said today that a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would eventually eliminate Iran's excuse for supporting regional terrorist groups. Eshki, who is leading a delegation of academics and businessmen looking to advance the Saudi-led peace plan, stressed that normalization of ties between Israel and the rest of the Arab world is dependent on resolving the conflict and that there is no regional solution without a peace deal with the Palestinians. 
Qatar announced it would send $31.6 million to the Gaza Strip to help pay the salaries of thousands of Palestinian public sector workers who have gone without full wages since 2013. The official Qatar news agency said the Emir described the donation as a way of alleviating the suffering of Palestinians in Gaza owing to an unjust siege imposed on them by the Israeli occupation. Hamas welcomed the decision. Turkey's President Tayyip Recep Erdogan is intensifying his purge with plans to disband the elite presidential guard after 300 of its members were arrested. According to Erdogan, since the failed coup and the declaration of a state of emergency, some 13,000 people have been detained in the widespread crackdown. Amid reports of suspected torture against those behind bars, thousands of judges, military personnel, including the country's first female combat pilot, civil servants, journalists, teachers and university deans have been arrested and private schools and institutions shut down. In Syria, an American Jew who had volunteered with the Kurds to fight ISIS has been killed. The man, identified as 24-year-old Levi Jonathan Shirley, was killed in a battle to take the key city of Manbij in northern Syria while in the ranks of the US-backed Kurdish People's Protection Units, known as the YPG. A native of Colorado, he had joined the Kurds a year and a half ago. His mother said she'd found out about his death in an email from a Kurdish official. She said he joined YPG after being denied entry to the US Marine Corps because of his poor eyesight. Hundreds of foreign volunteers have joined Kurdish fighters to fight ISIS, and Levi is the second American to be killed in action. A video released by the YPG shows Levi calling the Islamic State pure evil. I came here to Rojava to stop Daesh, or ISIS as it's known more commonly in America. Uh, they're my definition of pure evil. Uh, I don't think good people uh, in a society can stick other people inside of a cage and set them on fire. So, uh, yeah, I came here to stop that. Over in the United States, Hillary Clinton introduced her running mate this weekend, choosing Virginia Senator Tim Kaine as the Democratic Party's vice presidential candidate. More on the developments from IBA's Kalev Ben David. Hillary Clinton shows experience over excitement in picking veteran politician Tim Kaine to join her ticket as vice presidential candidate. The 58-year-old Kaine is serving his first term as senator from Virginia after a four-year stint as that state's governor. Kaine is viewed as a centrist who will appeal to mainstream voters outside the Democratic Party's progressive base and is familiar with global affairs as a member of the Senate's foreign policy and armed services committees. Clinton stressed that if necessary, he is fully qualified to step into the president's spot. I have to say that Senator Tim Kaine is everything Donald Trump and Mike Pence are not. He is qualified to step into this job and lead on day one. Kaine has been a strong supporter of Israel over the years, but sided with President Obama in his dispute with the Netanyahu government over the Iran nuclear treaty. In his first remarks as a candidate, Kaine took a shot at Donald Trump for questioning the value of U.S. membership in NATO. Ann and I have three kids. Our oldest son, Nat, is here today with his fiance. He is a, he's a proud Marine. And, and in just, in just a few days, he's deploying to Europe to uphold America's commitment to our NATO allies. For me, for me, this drives home the stakes in this election. Kane's own steady temperament and his reputation as a political nice guy will now surely be put to the test in what is shaping up to be a rough campaign against the Trump-Pence ticket. No, this is Kalev Ben David for IBA News. Jonathan Pollard, recently released from prison in the U.S. after serving 30 years for spying for Israel, is appealing against the restrictive terms of his probation. 
In a Manhattan federal court, Pollard's lawyer appealed against the requirements to wear an electronic tracking bracelet and submit Pollard's computer to monitoring, which he said was preventing Pollard from accepting an investment firm job. However, an assistant U.S. attorney justified the restrictions, arguing that Pollard could still harm U.S. national security if he disclosed more from the documents he compromised 30 years ago, and that he constitutes a flight risk in light of his expressed wish to move to Israel, which granted him citizenship during his prison sentence. Back here at home, the Knesset's Ministerial Committee for Legislation is reviewing a bill aimed at preventing incidents of children being forgotten in cars by requiring daycare centres and kindergartens to contact parents if a child fails to show up in the morning. The bill, sponsored by Fad Shasha Biton of Kulanu, comes after doctors at Sharay Tzedek Hospital were forced to pronounce the death of a 15-month-old toddler who was forgotten in a car in Beitar Elite on Friday. According to reports, her father had left her in the car in the boiling heat for an hour and a half before realizing his mistake. It was the fifth such incident to occur since the beginning of the year. According to the Beterem Safe Kids Israel organization, since 2008 there have been some 400 cases involving 449 children forgotten by parents and left inside locked cars, in many cases in sweltering heat. The Betzalel Academy of Arts and Design is proudly exhibiting the final projects of its graduates. I popped out of the studio last week to scout out the talent in Jerusalem's young art scene. What you can really experience here is the diversity and colors of young artists in Israel. The Betzalel Academy of Arts and Design has opened its doors again for its annual graduates exhibition, displaying the works of 400 young artists, designers and architects. This is a chair for hyperactive people that allows them to move while sitting, based on a Pilates ball. I designed a device based on UV light that sterilized milk in developing countries, supposed to save thousands of kids' lives all over the world. First stop, the School of Architecture, where Almog Ben Shoev is reimagining how evacuees from the Gaza disengagement should have been resettled while commemorating that expulsion. The project deals with um, the question of taking a community from one place to another and he, while um, protecting the values of this community. The plan involves a linear chain of settlement from Gaza to Judea cutting Israel in half with a high-speed road. This change of settlement is a permanent feature in the Israeli landscape. The idea is to integrate the evacuees into the local population while keeping their community life intact, copy-pasting each settlement into the Negev. The project is based on a research of how they lived in Gaza and try to copy this lifestyle to their new place. Among other ideas at the architecture school, an urban plan for Modi'in that designs public spaces based on the classification logic of an archive. And here's a plan to move the Hebrew University's Mount Scopus campus back to downtown Jerusalem, regenerating the area by integrating existing buildings. The old Eretz Israel Hotel would be transformed into a Sarona-like complex. And here's a new amphitheater that would overlook Jerusalem's Independence Park. Well, over at Mount Scopus, Hannah Gelman is displaying a thought-provoking work about religion in Israeli society. The God's Army is about the Haredi community, and it's sort of talking about the relationship between army and religion and militant, a militant life and a religious life, and where do these things meet, and where do they clash, and when does religion become army-like. This is the uniform that I designed for a soldier in God's Army in Svashem, and here you can see the ranks. I made different ranks for different levels within the um, journey that a soldier goes through when he's in God's army. Um, so these are the highest ranks of a rabbi. And then this rabbi, he also has um, his pins. So this pin is showing the level of his, um, the jurisdiction he has as a rabbi, which things he can decide um, halachically. These ones are for the Shisha Sidre Mishnah. Each one represents a different book of the Shisha Sidre Mishnah. And, um, and each one has its own uh, different symbol. These are the different awards that you can receive when you're the most prominent student in yeshiva. And I think that the most interesting part about it is the similarities that you can see between Haredi life and military life, all of the rules and the things you're allowed to do and you're not allowed to do, and the, um, the life that's very, very um, uh, ordered from morning till night. You know exactly where you're going to be and what you're going to be doing. And uh, it basically just wants to ask a lot of questions and, and challenge you. The Betzalel Academy's graduate exhibition runs till Friday the 29th of July. 
Catch it while you can. Elon Aslan Levy for IBA News. It's Sunday, and as always, we honor our promise to bring you five good news stories to start off the week. Israel's artistic gymnastics teams won a silver medal at the World Championship in Baku, Azerbaijan. The team of Israeli high school students racked up four medals at the international physics competition in Zurich, while students at the Mathematics Olympiad in Hong Kong brought home six medals. An end to endless queues at the supermarkets, a new Israeli app allows users to scan items on their phones and pay after the trolley is weighed. The app is already being used at the Tel Aviv branch of Osher Ad. A new Israeli miracle cream that can regrow damaged skin by utilizing one's own immune system has been successfully tested. Initial trials conducted by inventors BioTreat21 have rapidly healed injured skin and erased scars. And finally, Israeli startup Supermeat is developing a method for bioengineering cultured meat from animals. It's hoped that you wonder meat will have all the nutrients and flavor of real meat without harming animals at all. And in more good news, as if that wasn't enough, the Negev Desert hosted an international hot air balloon festival over the weekend, with over a dozen balloons sailing across the skies over the Eshkol Park near the city of Netivot. Thousands of people converged on the park to watch the magic of hot air flight in balloons in all shapes, from human heads and clowns to elephants and monkey heads. At one point, a parachutist delighted the crowd by leaping from a balloon shaped like a can of beer. Footage was provided by cameraman Barry Levinson. In finance, the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange is putting in a mixed showing today and there's no change in the shekel with currency markets having been closed since Friday. In weather, brace yourselves for a hot week. Temperatures will rise tomorrow and Tuesday to unseasonable heights. That's all for today. We'll be back again tomorrow, same time. Until then, as always, the IBA team will be glad to hear from viewers at ibaletters at gmail.com. I'm Elon Aslan Levy, wishing you a good evening and a stellar week live from Jerusalem. Sail along the silver sky so we can fly. Suspended under a twilight canopy We'll search the clouds for a 